Here's some help with the Experiment 8 pre-lab. Question 1 says write the oxidation number for the elements underlined in the following chemicals. Circle the more oxidized species. And on the left we have SO32-, that's sulfite, which is in wine, as you can see in the picture in the bottom left. And on the right we have SO42-, that's sulfate. And that is put in a lot of shampoos and soaps, as you can see in the bottom right. Okay, so we want to find the oxidation number for sulfur in each of these ions. So we know that the oxidation number or the charge on each all of the elements together have to add up to that the charge given for the whole ion in the top right. So the individual oxidation numbers of the sulfur and the three oxygens all have to add up to negative two. I have two elements, I have sulfur and I have oxygen, and I'm going to separate them by a plus sign. Now I have one sulfur atom, because I don't have a subscript there, so I just have the one that's written. I don't know the charge on sulfur, so I write an X. That's how you say I don't know in math. That's what we're trying to figure out. We have three oxygens, as you can see in the subscript. And so I'm going to write 3, and I know from its placement on the periodic table that oxygen has a negative 2 charge. So we'll have x minus 6 equals negative 2. Add 6 to both sides. 6 is cancel on the left, and you have x equals 4. So the oxidation number on sulfur in sulfite, SO3, 2 minus, is plus 4. Okay, let's do the same thing for sulfate. So here we know that all the charges on all the atoms have to add up to the charge of the whole ion, which is negative 2. So everything has to add up to negative 2. I have two elements, sulfur and oxygen, so I'm going to separate them with a plus sign. And then I have one sulfur. I don't know the charge on the sulfur, so I'm going to write an X. I have four oxygen atoms, as you can see in the subscript for oxygen. And I know from its placement on the periodic table that oxygen has a negative 2 charge. So that gives me x minus 8 equals negative 2. Add 8 to both sides. They cancel on the left, and you have x equals positive 6. So the oxidation number on sulfur in sulfate is positive 6. Okay, so the question said to write the oxidation number for the elements underlined in the following chemicals. And so I have a plus 4 for sulfite, for sulfur and sulfite. I have a plus 6 for the sulfur and sulfate. Then it says to circle the more oxidized species. So let's just take a second to talk about what oxidation is. So here I have it's just a series of numbers. Forget that we're even talking about chemistry. I have them listed from positive 2 down to negative 2. As you go from the top to the bottom, are the numbers increasing or reducing? The numbers are reducing, they're getting smaller. And so I'm going to keep these same numbers, but now I'm going to write them as charges on, atom, on an atom. And as you go down, just like before, the numbers are reducing. And so in chemistry, reduction is when the charge on an element becomes more negative. The subatomic particle that's negative is our electrons, and so that happens when you gain electrons. When you become more positive, you lose electrons. The fancy term for that is oxidation. So reduction is when the charge on an element becomes more negative, and oxidation is when the charge on an element becomes more positive. So here they want you to circle the more oxidized species. That's to say the more positive species. And that's positive 6 for the sulfur in sulfate on the right. Then for part B, it asks the same question, and it gives you two different molecules. So here, on the left, we want to write the oxidation number for the elements underlined in the following chemicals. Now, because if an element is ever all by itself, its oxidation number will be whatever is in the top right. So what I mean by all by itself is not that there's only one atom, but that there's only one element. If an element is not combined with any other element, the oxidation number for it will always be whatever is written in the top right. So here, iodine is not combined with other, any other element, so its oxidation number is going to be negative 1. Likewise, on the right side of the equation, that iodine is not combined with any other element. It's true you have two iodine atoms, 
but there isn't any other element there. So the oxidation number on that is going to be zero. So circle the more oxidized species. That's really saying circle the more positive species. And so the more positive species here is zero. So part C asks you to write the oxidation number for the elements underlying the following chemicals again. Here we have permanganate on the left, MnO4 one minus, and a manganese ion on the right. So to figure out the oxidation number on in, of manganese in permanganate, we know the charge of everything, both the manganese ion and the four oxygen ions, has to add up to negative one. So I'm going to put it equals negative one. I have two elements, manganese and oxygen. I'm going to separate them by a plus sign. I know I have one manganese atom, because I don't have a subscript written there next to the manganese. So that's one. I don't know the charge on manganese, so I'm going to write an X. I have four oxygen atoms, and I know from its placement on the periodic table that an oxygen has a negative two charge. So we have X minus eight equals negative one. Add eight to both sides, it cancels on the left, and you have X equals positive seven. So the oxidation number on manganese in permanganate, MnO4 one minus, is positive seven. That's positive seven on the right side of the equation Manganese is all by itself. It's not paired with any other element. So its oxidation number is going to be whatever is written in the top right. And in this case, that's positive 2. So then the question asks you to circle the more oxidized species. That's the more positive species. And so here, that's positive 7. Question 2 says, suppose there is a reaction between calcium and oxygen in the introduction. What element is oxidizing? and write the oxidation number for the reactant and product to show the oxidation. So the reaction is written below, and just so you can see this reaction, this is calcium metal, and as it's heated, it's gonna react with the oxygen in the air. You end up with a sort of white powder. So in that reaction, we wanna know what element is oxidizing. To do that, we're gonna write the oxidation number for the reactant and the product the reactants in the product. So here, calcium on the left in the reactants is all by itself. It's not paired with any other element. So its oxidation number is going to be whatever is written in the top right, and that's zero. Nothing's written in the top right. On the right side of the equation, it is paired with another element. So I'm going to get its oxidation number from the periodic table. And based on its placement in the periodic table, calcium has a plus two charge. Oxygen in the reactants on the left side of the arrow is not paired with any other element. So its oxidation number is going to be the same as whatever is written in the top right. Nothing is written in the top right, and so its oxidation number is going to be zero in the reactants. In the products, oxygen is paired with another element, and so I'm going to get its oxidation number from the periodic table. Based on its placement in the periodic table, oxygen has a negative two charge, and so calcium is going from a zero to a plus two oxidation number, and that is getting more positive, so it's oxidation. So calcium is oxidizing. Oxygen is going from zero to negative two, so that's becoming more negative, so that's reducing. So oxygen is reducing. So calcium is the element that's oxidizing. Question three says, write the molecular, ionic, and net ionic equations between the following reagents with the appropriate symbols of liquid, solid, etc. They give you barium chloride and sodium sulfate solution. So this question is really asking you for three things. It's asking you for one, the molecular equation, two, the ionic equation, sometimes called the complete ionic equation, and three, the net ionic equation for these two reagents. Okay, so first, conceptually, what's the difference? A molecular equation shows you how a reaction happens between whole molecules. So if you think of atoms as Legos, then a molecule would be like a little car or something that you build with it. And so you're showing the whole molecules reacting in a molecular equation. A net ionic equation doesn't show you everything in all the molecules. It's just showing you where the action happens. It's zooming in on the action. A net ionic equation shows you how two aqueous ions stick together to give you a solid. 
So you mix two liquids together, they just look like clear liquids. You mix them and suddenly a solid starts raining out of solution. That solid has a special name, it's called a precipitate, and the abbreviation for it is PPT. Okay, so first let's try to write the molecular equation. So the first step you want to take is to write the ions for each element in the reactants. Now you don't want to write exactly the reactants first. First you just want to write what ion that element, what charge that element has, each element has, when it becomes an ion. So for example, barium. When barium is an ion, it has a plus two charge. So I'm going to write Ba plus two. When chlorine is an ion, it has a negative one charge. So I'm going to write Cl negative one. When sodium is an ion, it has a plus one charge. So I'm going to write Na plus one. And sulfate, sulfate is a polyatomic ion. The hint there is that it doesn't end in an IDE. Whenever you have a uh, something a name that does not end in IDE, it's a hint that you probably have a polyatomic ion. So you would go to a list of polyatomic ions. Here, this is Appendix F in your book. And you see that sulfate is SO4 2 minus. So I write SO4 2 minus. So I haven't combined these ions at all. I just have the ions. So here, let me combine them to get first the reactants. So I'm going to mix barium with chlorine, because barium chloride is one of the reactants. To do that, I'm going to crisscross the charges. So whatever is a superscript on one element is going to become a subscript on the other one. So here the 2 on top of barium is going to become a subscript for chlorine, and the 1 on top of chlorine is going to become a subscript for barium. Notice that I don't include the signs, I'm just including the numbers. Also notice that if you have a 1, it's implied by just writing the symbol for the element, so you don't have to write the number 1 in. Okay, so I have BaCl2 as my first reactant. Then I have sodium, Na plus 1, and sulfate, SO4 2 minus. So I'm going to crisscross the charges, and the 1 that was on a superscript in sodium becomes a subscript in sulfate. Ones are not ever explicitly written, they're just implied by writing the other ion. And the 2 that's on top of sulfate becomes a subscript for sodium. So those are my two reagents. They're going to react and give me products. How do I know what products I get? So that's step two. You want to combine the cation, that's the ion with the positive charge, from one reactant with the anion, that's the ion with the negative charge, from the other reactant. So for example, barium is the cation from the first reactant. Sulfate is the anion from the second reactant. So I'm going to combine those two. If ions ever have the same charge, then you just rewrite them without the charges. So barium sulfate would be written BaSO4, and that's because the two ions have the same charge. If they have different charges, then you crisscross them, like we saw with the reactants. Okay, so that's one product. The other product is going to be done with the same thing, but I'm going to choose the other cation, that's sodium, and the other anion, that's chlorine. So Na plus 1, Cl minus 1. Because the charges are the same, I'm just going to rewrite it, NaCl. Those are going to be my two products. Okay, the third step is now to balance this equation. I have one barium on the left, I have one barium on the right, so barium is good. I have two chlorines on the left, I only have one chlorine on the right, so I'm going to add a 2 there. So now every time you add a number, you should start over. So I have one barium on the left, one barium on the right, two chlorines on the left, two chlorines on the right, two sodiums on the left, two sodiums on the right, and because sulfate is a polyatomic ion, it's the same on both sides, I'm going to consider that as just one thing. I'm not going to consider sulfur and oxygen separately because it's a polyatomic ion that doesn't break up. You can see that it exists on both sides of the equation. So I have one sulfate on the left and one sulfate on the right. So I have a balanced equation. Okay, now I just need to add the phases. So to do that, we're going to use the solubility table. Anything that's soluble on the solubility table, we're going to give AQ for aqueous. That means it's dissolving in water. And anything that's insoluble on the solubility table, we're going to give an S for solid. So it's not dissolving in water. So this is my reaction. Now I'm going to take these molecules one at a time, and I'm going to look at them on a solubility table. So BaCl2. 
So if I look at the solubility table that's in Appendix D in your book, I find either of the ions. It could either be barium or chlorine. I found chlorine first, so Cl minus. And it says that most of these are soluble. It has some exceptions, but barium is not one of them. So this is going to be soluble. So because it's soluble, I write Aq for aqueous, dissolving in water. I'm going to do the same thing for sodium sulfate. I'm going to look for either sodium or sulfate. Whichever one I find first is the one I'm going to use. I found sulfate first. Most of those are soluble. They list some exceptions, but notice in all the exceptions you don't have sodium. So that means sodium sulfate is soluble. So I'm going to write Aq as the subscript there. I'm going to do the same thing with barium sulfate. So again, I find sulfate. I could have also found barium, but sulfate was the one I found first. So most sulfates are soluble, but when I look at the exceptions, you can see that at the far right, you have barium. And so when barium combines with sulfate, it's insoluble. Because it's insoluble, I'm going to write an S for solid as the phase for barium sulfate. And then sodium chloride. I find either sodium or chlorine, whichever one is first. I found chlorine first, and it says these are all soluble. The exceptions that are there do not include sodium. So sodium chloride is soluble, and I write an AQ for aqueous. And that is my molecular equation. It shows you how whole molecules, barium chloride and sodium sulfate, react to give you other whole molecules, barium sulfate and sodium chloride. Okay, now we want to get from here to just the action. We want to zoom in on the action. The action is shown in the net ionic equation. But in order to get there, we have to go through an intermediate equation called the complete ionic equation. So how do you find that? The first thing you want to do is to break apart anything that's aqueous in the molecular equation into ions and keep anything that's solid together. You keep it exactly as it is in the molecular equation. As we do this, note that the coefficient in front of a molecule goes in front of both ions when they separate. And also notice that subscripts become coefficients. So for example, this is our reaction. Barium chloride is aqueous, so I'm going to write them as individual ions. Just for reference, I'm going to, I wrote the ions that we found earlier up at the top. So I'm going to use those. I'm going to write barium as an ion, so it has a plus 2 charge. And it's going to keep the same phase as it has when it's a molecule, aqueous. I have chlorine, also aqueous. And I write the charge that I had at the top. Notice that the subscript became a coefficient. Then I have sodium. I write the ion that I have at the top. It's aqueous because it, it's aqueous in the molecule, and notice that the subscript became a coefficient. And then I have sulfate. It's the ion that I wrote at the top, and because it's, uh, the molecule it comes from is aqueous, the sulfate's going to be aqueous too. All right, as a product, I have barium sulfate, but you'll notice that that's solid, so I'm not going to break that up. I'm going to keep that exactly as it is. And then I have sodium chloride, which is aqueous, so I am going to break that up into ions. I'm going to have two sodiums, that's going to be aqueous, and then I'm going to have two chlorines. Notice that the two also goes with chlorine. Note that the coefficient in front of the molecule goes in front of both ions when they separate. So that gives me my complete ionic equation. Okay, so now to get to the net ionic equation. Notice how in the complete ionic equation there are ions that are the same on both sides of the equation. So these do not react, they just sit back and watch the reaction happen, and so they're called spectator ions. They're not interesting. We're interested in the atoms that react. So to get the net ionic equation, we're going to cancel out the ions that are the same on both sides of the complete ionic equation. So if you look on the left side, you have barium 2 plus on the left. You don't have barium 2 plus aqueous on the right, and so I'm not going to cancel that out. If you look on the left, you have 2 Cl minus aqueous on the left. You also have that at the far right, and so I'm going to cancel those two out. On the left, you have 2 Na plus aqueous. You also have 2 Na plus aqueous on the right, so I'm going to cancel that out. And on the left, you have SO4 2 minus aqueous. You don't have that exact thing on the right, so I'm not going to cancel that out. Then I just rewrite everything that's not canceled out, and that's my net ionic equation. It shows you the action that's taking place. Those two ions are going to stick together and give you a solid. So that's my net ionic equation. Now we've done all that work. What does that actually look like? So this is a video of that reaction. 
and you can see those that solid raining out of solution, the barium sulfate. It's often used to visualize x-rays. Okay, now your book uh, asks you to do three of these types of problems, and I just want to make a couple notes about the other ones. These are similar to the other two. If you have an acid, it's going to be an H, and then whatever symbol comes after the hydro. That's if you have an acid with something that's in group 7A. So hydrobromic acid is HBr. If you had hydrochloric acid, that would be HCl. Another thing is with hydroxides. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. It's OH1 minus. When you combine that with something that has a plus 2 charge, like usual, you crisscross the charges. You might be tempted to just write it like this, but this would really mean that you have one oxygen and two hydrogens, when really what you want is two hydroxide ions. So if you ever have more than one polyatomic ion, always make sure you put parentheses around it when you have a subscript bigger than one. Okay, and then the last example that's similar to the one you have is you have a Roman numeral that comes after a name. That's giving you the charge. So whatever the Roman numeral is, that's the positive charge that, that, ion, that the ion that's named before it has. So here, lead 2, that's lead 2 plus. So hopefully with those hints, you'll be able to, to um, get those reactions. This is, these are just a couple other videos. This is a video of the lead precipitating out. Precipitation reactions can be very beautiful. And then this one just for fun. These are single drops filmed with a microscope. Question 4 says, for each of the following salts, indicate if you would expect it to be soluble S or insoluble I in water. It lists a bunch of compounds. So these are really just being able to read the solubility table. Here it's in Appendix D on page 170. So if they give you strontium sulfate, you're going to look for either of those ions. Here we have sulfate. You see that most of them are soluble. It gives you some exceptions, and indeed strontium is one of the exceptions. So that's going to be insoluble, and you'd write insoluble or I. If you tried to do the same thing with AgClO4, silver perchlorate, um, you might get a little frustrated. You can't find perchlorate on the solubility table that's in, given in your lab book. But if you look up another one, you see that the rules for ClO3- minus and ClO4- minus are about the same, and they're both nearly always soluble, with few exceptions. So silver perchlorate would be soluble, and you'd write an S. You go through a similar thing for barium nitrate. You see nitrate. You see that it's soluble. There are no exceptions, and so that would be soluble, and you'd write an S. So hopefully you can do the same thing for silver chloride and ammonium bromide.